So maybe I've just said this exact sentence before, but mostly we focus on the word level. Can we identify the word part of speech tagging? Um, thinking about meaning in our last section when we we're doing named entity recognition. Okay. And now we're going to move up to sentences. So we start small, we're working up to big. Okay. And that really allows us to think about other particularly problematic things about dealing with language, um, mainly that sentences can be very creative, which is cool. That makes it uniquely human thing. Uh, but then also slightly problematic because that means we have to write code that deals with that creativity. And so two big issues. Ambiguity is the other one. You see creativity is the second one here. And so ambiguity is this idea that words have multiple meanings. And sometimes the way that things are phrased is not clear what meaning should be um, activated, or what meaning should be the right one. Further, um, we often say things that uh, include references to either previous sentences or sentences to come. And so, uh, you know, fiction novels make a lot of use of this where they say like, well, he said blah, blah, blah. And you just have to remember who he is. And so the ambiguity can be um, ambiguity in structure that leads to uh, not a, a a misunderstanding or maybe like a, a incorrect understanding of what's going on in the sentence or it could be ambiguity in meaning or um, as you'll see in a second it's ambiguity of where that modifying clause goes okay so um, that example will make more sense in a couple minutes and so what we're going to do is try to answer these questions can we use a formal grammar to describe the structure of an unlimited set of sentences. So if you've ever tried to write, let's say a chat bot, right? So the people who write things like Siri, Siri is really complex, but things that just chat back and forth. So for example, today, I was just explaining this to my partner. I was like, hey, so I had to contact Amazon because I bought something and the seller was like, oh yeah, this isn't working, we'll cancel it. And I was like, great, but they never really canceled it and they never really shipped it. So it's like in Amazon limbo. It says like, it, it's arriving late. I'm like, no, it's not, it's never been shipped. But they never canceled it either. So I like got onto Amazon's chat and I'm like, hey, the seller told me they were gonna cancel this. I don't know what's happening. And it was like the strangest interaction because it's pretending to be a human person but a lot of the like phrases and stuff were very odd. Um, even in for a second language speaker, if I assume, okay, well maybe it's just because they don't know English very well. It's still very odd. Like, we'll apply the strictest of penalties to them because you're the best customer. And I was just like, listen, I just want you to cancel this order. <laughs> it's not that hard. Um, so if you're trying to write a system that is intelligently responding to to stuff, um, you have to know how, grammatically how, how to structure things, right? And so there's formal grammar, like you would learn in grade school, and then there's the way people really talk. And so can we write a grammar that allows us to process sentences, because if we can process them, we can certainly make them. And then how do we build these things and look at syntax trees? Syntax trees are kind of you know, this chapter to me is really a building block to doing other cool things. Like it's, it's like if you understand constituency and dependency parsing, you can then use it to do other things. But in and itself, it's probably going to be like, why are we learning this? Um, but if I have a syntax tree, I can tell how people are going to, um, how people should interpret sentences. And we can help clarify text that we find is not um, is ambiguous, right? So it helps us with ambiguity. It also helps us with understanding um, <coughs> the Greek. <coughs> Complexity is the word I was trying to go for there. <coughs> okay, so how do parsers analyze sentences and automatically build syntax trees? And then can we build our own parsers? That's next week. Okay, so here is a demonstration on why this stuff is hard. 
So let's say we've got, um, we're deciding, we're going to talk about Usain Bolt, one of the fastest man ever, right? The fastest man, whatever. So he broke the 100 meter record. Perfectly understandable sentence. I could say that the Jamaica Observer reported that he broke the 100 meter record. Okay. I could say that Andre said that the Jamaica reporter, Observer, reported that he broke the record. Or I could say, well, I think that he's the one that told me that. So this kind of structure, this like sentence in sentence in sentence structure, really makes things difficult because this is normal. That kind of last sentence, while complex, is pretty normal. Right? I think that he told me this thing happened, right? Um, especially on soap operas. <clears throat> uh, so, how do I write a program that can handle the fact that this is sentence a sentence inside of a sentence? And so, all of these have the same semantic meaning, but creativity. This is a demonstration of creativity. Um, can be can make writing a parser difficult. So they're all uttered and written differently. So how do I handle that? And what we're looking at really is a sentence, uh, that sentence. Um, so it's like a sentence, and then there's a set of verbs that you can do here, and then add a new sentence to it. <clears throat> and that whole process is called recursion. So here's one of the longest sentences. It's in actually Winnie the Pooh. And this first thing is just like the previous sentence. And then all of this um, is one giant sentence. Okay. And it's a little um, rambly, right? So it goes on and on forever. But it shows us this idea of like, well, sentences must have this like known ending point. And in theory, they could never end. You can just keep slapping on ands and thats and keep going forever. And, um, you know, this presents problems for parsers that are trying to break down these sentences. Because if you're trying to write in a system that you know, chats back and forth, the first thing you have to do is break down the sentence that they've given you. And we know how to do part of speech tagging, cool, but, and we kind of have gotten a little bit into meaning using WordNet and named entity recognition, but now I have to understand the structure of that sentence to be able to write one back. And this sentence structure is freaking crazy. So this kind of, of a language characteristic is what makes uh, writing AI kind of difficult. And so, the general structure for recursion is kind of a sentence, but sentence, when sentence. So you can use these coordinating or uh, combining conjunction. You can do this with prepositions. The word that, that does almost everything in the English language. Uh, and, uh, and then some verb choices. <clears throat> And so this whole property, again, is called recursion. We could create endlessly long sentences. We shouldn't because our users, let's say um, you're writing for a website or something, you don't create long sentences because people are much better at short sentences without what are called embedded clauses. This whole thing is like a masterpiece of embedded clauses. And that just means that there are like a lot of commas, or like an embedded clause. So, if the purpose of this is to understand grammar, because we've already understood part of speech, grammar and syntax, how can we define that, right? So it's a system or the structure of the language. Most languages have very similar grammatical rules. We think that grammar is mildly innate, meaning we're kind of born naturally understanding it. And 75%, I've seen this statistic, I don't know how true it still is, but probably approximately that about 75% of languages have a grammar structure of subject, verb, object. Now we don't always agree where one puts adjectives or um, adverbs, even in English, 
But the general structure is that there's some sort of noun phrase with a subject in the sentence, some sort of verb phrase, and then potentially a finalizing verb uh, noun phrase with an object. Like, I kicked the ball. It's subject, verb, object. Okay. And that structure, especially word order, gives us clues to the meaning. So who's kicking? Me, because I came first. And so here's an example of some recursion in a parse tree. Like uh, zooming in and out is not doing me any good. So uh, here's the idea. This is the whole sentence. Chatterer said that, know that Chatterer said Buster thought the tree was tall. Okay. And so here's the first sentence. Chatterer said. Here's the second sentence. Buster thought sentence. And then the last full sentence, the tree was tall. So by building one of these trees, I can tell this sentence is more complex than other sentences because I can just count the depth. Right? So I could say, well, it goes from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight deep. Okay. And that's pretty far. Okay. A very simple sentence is only about three deep. Okay, so one three usually kind of here. So the the more complex the sentence is the larger these trees get obviously um, and the, the kind of further down they go. And so this is Chomsky so generative grammar is his approach to kind of describing and understanding language. And really what his argument kind of boils down to because it's Generative grammar is actually fairly complex, but the one sentence version is that we are kind of born understanding the, the basic idea of syntax and grammar. Okay? And language is just a giant collection of all these grammatical sentences. And what we know is that these we have these underlying logical rules that allow us to generate these grammatical sentences. And meaning is built then on top of those parts of the sentence. So we have this sort of like built-in system that says this is grammatical and therefore, because of word order or because of grammar rule number 17, we know what this sentence means, as long as we know what the words mean. And the part that's learned from our environment is the actual words that go on top of all of this and the relationship between words and their meaning. So knowing what a dog is. And so therefore meaning is built from grammar. Um, fairly popular theory. And there are some biological components that support this idea. There's a not a gene. What is it? Is it a protein? What is FOXP2? So yeah, it's a protein. So FOXP2 is this protein um, that is encoded by this gene. And it's like, it's not like, I, I hesitate to say that there is a grammar gene because that is wildly misleading, but there is this particular FOXP2 thing that, um, if broken, appears to also break language, okay? but specifically grammar. Okay. People who have um, a mutation in this gene have a hard time creating and understanding grammatical sentences. And so it does appear that there is some sort of like genetic component to this. There's also two sections, uh, more than this, but two big sections of the brain that do um, processing. Broca's area here in the front that does what do I want to say? What how what response do I want to plan back? It's sort of abstract thinking and processing um, up here in the prefrontal cortex. And then a uh, system back here behind kind of your ear, Wernicke's area, that does um, processing of language and speech and all that stuff. And then they talk to each other, so there's a connection, a system of connections between them. So it comes in, you go, hmm, that's interesting. You figure out what you want to say, and then the cycle continues. Okay. Um, so it's clearly partially genetic. 
And then it's also clearly partially environmental in the sense that, you know, many of you speak different languages, so clearly there's some sort of environment interaction here, otherwise uh, we'd all come out talking and walking like we're born. <clears throat> all right, so uh, that's creativity. So that whole section is creativity. A generative grammar allows us to be creative. Probably didn't make that connection super clear. Second problem, ambiguity. So, this is a very famous Groucho Marx sentence. Um, I shot an elephant in my pajamas. And while this is going to seem a little silly, come along with me here. Um, the question is, who's wearing the pajamas? Most of you be like, clearly it's me. Uh, people wear pajamas, not elephants. But grammatically, that preposition phrase right here is not clear which noun it should modify. So that has a modifying phrase, and it's not clear if it should be you, the original, the actor in the sentence, or if it should be the um, act, the, the second noun, elephant. Basic grammatical constituency parsing actually would argue that the elephant's wearing the pajamas. We, as adults, unless you're being silly, okay, mostly impose that meaning constraint on this sentence that you know that people wear pajamas and not elephants. Children actually do it about both, half both ways. And so there's an interaction of the syntax, the structure of the sentence, and our um, in imposing of meaning on top of that syntax. Because this syntactically is not clear which one it should modify. It could go either way. Now, most processing parsers will actually do what's called um, minimal attachment, where it sticks it on the closest noun. So it would actually be the elephant and not the person. Both in pajamas, I like that option too. <laughs> um, now, the my part is fun as well because if you interpret this as I shot the elephant in my pajamas, okay, I'm wearing my own pajamas, but then <laughs> the other interpretation would be you shot the elephant who is wearing your pajamas, which is even funnier. That's why it's a Groucho Marx bit. But any kind of sentence with this kind of uh, noun, verb, noun, preposition phrase could potentially be fairly ambiguous. Okay. All right, so there are multiple ways to create these phrase structure trees that we'll see here in a minute. So let me just talk about this one. All right, so, so you know, this semester I've talked a lot about grammatical slots, places where words are supposed to go. And so words have um, specific uh, they're, given the grammar uh, and the current structure of the sentence, the next word is constrained. Okay. Now, it's partially constrained by the type of verb. So when we do dependency parsing, we'll mostly talk about verbs because um, verbs often drive what can and cannot happen in a sentence, more so than nouns. And what I mean by that is that there are um, conjugations for verbs, but also they are transitive or intransitive or what's called ditransitive, okay. meaning I shot is not really a valid sentence um, because you're left going, you shot what? So shot is a word that requires a direct object. So that slot opens up once you use that verb. Um, and the conjugations are another issue. So let's see here. Whoa. What is this sentence? Okay. Uh, wait. Oh, downsize. You mean like shrunken down? Like small? Oh, okay. I was like down. When I heard downsize, I thought like business cutting down. You mean like, honey, I shrunk the elephant. And we were inside the pajamas. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so I shot an elephant in the tunnel, so a location cue would, would not be ambiguous. Yeah. 
elephant in the pajamas would actually maybe not be ambiguous either. No. So if you said, I shot an elephant in the pajamas, I guess, I don't know. You're either showing off the pajamas, like hunter style, uh, these were the ones that I shot the elephant in, right? Or you're in the, the, there are more than one elephant, so one of them's wearing pajamas. Okay, we've gotten totally off track here, but, um, but yeah, uh, what you're talking about is a location cue, so the type of noun in that prepositional phrase actually makes it unambiguous using the word tunnel. Uh, okay, but, so that's a grammatical slide. It's got a, a meaning-based restriction on it. We can also have um, word type restrictions on it. So mostly driven by verbs. And so that's why, uh, if you will see coming up later in the notes, there's a whole section called verbs are special about all this. Um, so if there are combinations of words that are important, we might be able to learn a little bit about sentence structure and generate our own sentence structures by just looking at bigrams, so pairs of words together. And that will only get you so far um, because the constraints on grammatical slots are often placed both by the syntax or requirement based on the type of verb, for example, and by meaning. So you wouldn't, um, you, there are certain combinations that don't make sense. So I'm trying to say. So if I took some of our previous um, example sentences from uh, a couple of chapters now, I could combine them together. And you see this, I think, so I was like at one point trying to like write this program that would, um, was deep learning, but I didn't really give it a whole lot of training. So I'll say deep, un, poorly trained systems that um, would read in a text and then try to recreate the text. Oh, it's like this Twitter thing. Oh, 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 where is this thing? Hold on. We're going to show you. I have all my friends talking about movies because they're all bored. Where is this Twitter bot thing? Have you guys seen this? Oh my gosh, my friend Julia's hysterical. P.S. But um, you don't want to learn about um, sensation and perception tonight. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Oh, I saw like six people do this earlier. Have y'all seen this thing going around on Twitter where people have it based on your tweets generate um, tweets that you would tweet? Have you seen this? Somebody seen this? Graduation. Yada, yada, yada. Oh, come on. Who did this? My friend Iko did this. Hold on. Okay. So. Oh, is it not working? Is it overloaded? Damn it. Okay, fine. I will copy this. And I will put it and then later we should play with it. So essentially what it does is it takes in your tweets and then mimics what you might say based on your tweets, but it might be, um, they might have it either down or it's just overloaded because everybody <laughs> thought it was so cool. And this is a friend of mine who I know what he talks about and he talks a lot about measurement issues and um, what it does is it essentially just kind of kind of like combines them based on bigram and trigram frequencies, and it must be some sort of Markov chain. Okay. Uh, and I saw several of my friends doing this, so I'm gonna plop this into um, our modules here, and then hopefully it'll start working and we can play with it, because this is a perfect example of why parsing is so interesting. Like I said, hopefully it'll start working later. Send them a message. Okay. So not cool because we can't get to use it, but 
Um, that one works much better than the one I was trying to write, where it just basically like spat back out nonsense. But this is the kind of thing that you might do: is just say, okay, take a bunch of of pairs of words and learn what kind of pairs of words tend to go together, and then just spit back out random pairs. Okay. And this is sort of a game that you can play on your phone where you're using the predictive text. So let me try one. Okay. Let's see here. Let's say I am just going to randomly text my better half here. And let's say I want to, and now I can use the predictive text to have it tell me what I want to do. Right? Let's see. I want to go back and get some <laughs> uh, coffee because that's a good choice. <laughs> and stuff. Okay. And so what it's doing when you use like the predictive text options that most text Android or, or iPhones do is it looks at your common next word. So like given what you've already written, what's the next word you're more like more than likely to do? Um, and predict from that. And that's what happened here. But this particular sentence, he roared with me, the pail slipped down his back it didn't work right so it doesn't make a lot of sense now the systems that these predictive text things use are a little more complicated than individual brigrams not too much but they have way more data right they've got all of your text <laughs> so uh, they tend to work a little better and that actually would be something funny i might text um someone in my uh, uh, contacts and so here's another one, the worst part and clumsy looking for whoever heard light. Now, some of these are actually grammatically okay. They're not the best, but they're okay, but they don't make any, any sense. Okay? And so this whole concept of these ideas of like, we can uh, take syntax and play with it is really tied to a very famous Chomsky illustration, which is that colorless green ideas sleep furiously. Okay. That is uh, adjective, adjective, noun, verb, adverb. That is a grammatical sentence okay, that does not mean anything unless you've heard it as many times as I have when it means, ah, Chomsky. Okay. And so the, the idea was that we can't have one, just one of these systems, right? So we have the underlying syntax system that constrains the part of speech that could go next okay, and the requirements for what slots there are. So this word requires a direct object. So I need subject, verb, object. This word does not. So subject, verb, okay. um, this is past tense. So yada, 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 right? Um, that's only half of the system. The other half is the meaning based component on it, right? So, so the, the, constraints on what words could be possible have to come from two sides. Okay. Or you end up with syntactically correct sentences that make no sense. All right, and that system where it's syntactically correct but doesn't make a lot of sense is called word salad sometimes. Um, mainly from clinical psychology literature where they're talking about schizophrenics. And so for some schizophrenics, what you'll see is that the meaning-based system just stops working totally. Um, and they'll, they'll say a lot of sentences that are grammatically correct but make like no, zero sense. Okay. You also see word salad sometimes with um, uh, Broca's or Radicus. Broca's is broken, you get the meaning, but it's very slow. I think it's Wernicke's. If Wernicke's is broken, it's just a lot of like blah, 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 like just garbage coming out. Okay. If Broca's, the one on the front is broken, people can give you grammatic, like things that meaningfully make sense, but they have a hard time with the grammar part of it. Okay. And so, so what we have to think about is sometimes called coordinate structure. If part one and part two 
are phrases in a grammatical category, like noun phrase and verb phrase, then part one and part two um, are, are, are acceptable, basically. This is not quite worded in the most perfect way. So basically, if uh, phrase one and phrase two are both noun phrases, then they probably can go together. So let's look at an example of that. So the book's ending, this is where the, um, our two previous sentences were generated from. So the book's ending was the worst part and the best part for me. I feel like everyone has this novel that like, it was great, it was great, it was great, and then you get to the end and you're like, what was that? What was this trash? Why is it like that? Um, now, the, be the worst part and the best part here, the combination of these two things, are both noun phrases. The worst part, the best part, are determinant adjective nouns. Since they're both noun phrases, this is a, a sentence that makes sense. Uh, we can instead switch to adjective phrases. So on land, they're slow and clumsy looking. Uh, I don't know if this is like turtles or sloths or what exactly they're talking about. But both of those are adjective phrases, slow and then clumsy looking. Combine those two, works great, excellent. However, if you mix and match the worst part and clumsy looking for whoever heard like of our sentences, yeah, that doesn't make sense. So we've got an adjective phrase, I'm sorry, a noun phrase and an adjective phrase. Because we mixed and matched, and it's no good. Uh, and then the same thing with the other one. Uh, he roared with me, the pale slipped down his back. Right, there's uh, too many combinations of noun and adjective phrases. All right, I don't love this picture. I can't find a better one though. I wish I could, I just need to make one of my own. But what we're getting into now is called constituent structure. So generally there's kind of two ways that people build parsers. And that's constituency grammar or sometimes called phrase structure grammar and then dependency grammar. And we're gonna do constituency stuff tonight and do for, uh, dependency stuff next week. So this is understand, because dependency grammar is built from constituency grammar, so it's, you gotta learn this one first. And to understand this idea, you kind of can think about word substitution. Okay. So constituent structure is this concept that words come together to form these phrasal units. It might be a noun phrase, a verb phrase, or an adjective phrase, or an adverb phrase. That's usually R, P, for adverbs. A um, PP, also, preposition phrase. And so what I could do is take um, the entire phrase and replace it with another word. Although this is really just not the best example. It's from the NLTK book, but I just... Sometimes I think it's more confusing than it's worth, but so the little bear saw the fine fat trout in the brook. The little bear here is a noun phrase, and I could replace this entire noun phrase with a single word like he. Saw is clearly the verb phrase, you can't really do a whole lot with that. Um, but verb phrases don't have to include preposition phrases, they can just be one giant verb. So constituency grammar really is this idea that um, just like politics, words have little um, divisions. What is the word I'm looking for here? Since we're about to do some, some voting here in Pennsylvania. Um, there's another word for constituency. Ooh. Areas, counties, I don't know. You guys get the idea, um, hopefully. Uh, words have little, like, cities, if you will, that they can go into. And they're constituents, meaning they're, like, members of those cities. And so um, this kind of structure really allows us to build these parse trees, and we can see how complex they are. So this one's not nearly as complex as our first one. And that sentence breaks into a noun phrase and a verb phrase. That verb phrase further breaks down into a verb phrase, 
and a preposition phrase, so we broke off this one, and then this verb phrase further breaks down into a verb and a noun phrase. And so the idea behind constituency parsing is to basically take a sentence and break it down into individual tokens, but show how those tokens relate to each other. And that relationship is based on their part of speech. So that's why last sections were so important. Um, and those parts of speech kind of build up into phrases. And so what we would write to understand this is often called context-free grammar. So context-free grammars um, are basically this idea that we only look at kind of, um, we don't look at all of the requirements for a word. So we don't look at the fact that this, this one is past tense and every other word has to be past tense. We just look at the fact that it's a verb. Um, or, you know, kind of ignore the fact that some verbs are require direct objects, like kind of ignoring uh, the semantics and some of the syntactic rules. But generally, these tend to work pretty well. Uh, Context-free grammars allow us to break down or put together sentences. So we'll do a little bit of this in NLTK, and then next week we'll do more spacey. Um, and so if I'm trying to create some sort of literature, let's say you're trying to write some sort of marketing or um, a how-to guide, a manual, if you will, what you could do is process your sentences to make sure that they are ambiguous. I can't tell you how many GitHub mangles I have read that I'm like, what, what, what? Guilty probably as well in my instructional stuff, but it would be useful to know if there were multiple ways to process the sentence um, so that it's not ambiguous. Right? Uh, <clears throat> Now, in this, there are several syntactic categories, so here are some examples. We can have S for sentence. These are the common, I've already been using them, but here's what they are. Um, common, uh, what's the word, what's the word? Uh, abbreviations for stuff. So S for sentence, NP for noun phrase, VP for verb phrase, PP for prepositional phrase, DET for determinant, N for noun, V for verb, P for preposition, and then there's um, uh, sometimes you see JJ or just J for adjectives, RB for adverbs. And there are more of them. These are kind of a, a take on our parts of speech that we did a couple weeks ago. So let's see how parsing is achieved using a context for grammar. So parsing, which is the act, or a parser, which is the program, creates these constituents and their structure that conform to a specific grammar. So the programs are, are trained on a grammar or simply told, here's the rules for the grammar, and then they take a sentence and apply those rules to it. And so what we've already built, we've done, we've built tokenizers, or we've looked at tokenizers that break things down into individual words. We've looked at taggers and built our own part of speech taggers. We have not gotten to classification. That's after this section. And then we haven't, um, we're kind of doing chunking now. So chunking is where you take um, sections of a sentence that you're interested in. So technically an NER tagger is a chunker. It's just such an ear, weird word to use because it always sounds like barfing to me. I don't love chunking. Um, cognitive psych actually has a different definition for chunking, which is where we create little mini structures that help us remember things. Like if you've ever given somebody a phone number, you do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, right? Um, that's considered chunking. And so parsers are simply interpreters of a defined grammar. So it looks through all the possible options that they've been shown and matches it to the sentence as best it can. So by, na by the nature of it, parsers have to understand part of speech. 
And we can evaluate a parser in the same way that we've evaluated our other functions. And when we get into classification, we'll talk a lot more about this idea, but basically we can see how correct we're getting it. So when we did our taggers, we looked at um, accuracy. Okay. There are training data sets for this kind of stuff, and we get to see how accurate we're doing. All right, so a goal of a parser is to, um, from the academic standpoint, uh, model essentially what process is happening. So if we understand how humans process syntax, then we can write AI programs that, that also process slash write syntax back. Okay. From a analytics perspective, parsers can be used for a lot of different things. They're often the first of the third step, right? Cleaning the data, it's part of speech tagging. Um, to systems that are answer question and answer systems. Okay. So it'll take it and process what you've typed in and then answer back. And so they break down sentences for, oh, question. Here's what I just said. So we're going to do a couple of types of parsers. We're going to take a four second break while I deal with whatever's going on with my contact. It's like blink is funny. I can only see half the screen. Um, and then we're going to talk about uh, recursive descent parsing and shift reduce parsers and left corner parsers. So take a two second mental break. I'll be right back. So that's better, I think. I just got really dry it out. Make sure I'm still in the light. I don't like how bad that light was. There we go. In the screen. All right. So recursive descent parsing. And this is probably the simplest parsing technique, and it works pretty well. So find the sentence. Easy enough. We have talked with tokenizers. So we found, we built a tokenizer. It's going to break down. Here's the sentence. Then, sentences pretty much all have noun phrases. They might be implied, but most of them have noun phrases and verb phrases. Cool. Break it down into that, noun phrase and verb phrase. Then, find um, the embedded clauses, which are noun phrases and verb phrases that are within those. So many verb phrases have embedded noun phrases, like I kicked the ball. Kicked the ball is the large verb phrase, and then we have the verb and then the noun phrase, the ball. And what we're ultimately looking for is where the, the leftmost side of any phrase structure is the type of phrase it is. So I think that makes more sense if you look at a picture. On recursive descent parsing. Here. Mm. Where's that example? So we got this. Where's my giant picture? There it is. Okay. <clears throat> so the goal here is to find the leftmost side. So this is a noun phrase, so the leftmost side has to be a noun. Verb phrase, the leftmost side is a verb. The noun phrase, the leftmost side is usually a noun, sometimes a determinant. We kind of can sometimes ignore determinants, right? Verb phrase, verb. And so that's what I mean by leftmost side. It's considered a top down parser. And what that means is that it 
starts with the largest part, the sentence, and then breaks down them breaks down into smaller pieces until it reaches the part of speech level. And it uses the inputted grammar to predict what how that might break down. So here's kind of a picture of a recursive descent parser. It first found, finds the sentence, a dog saw a man in the park. Then it finds the first noun phrase. Ooh, noun phrase, verb phrase. So everything after this becomes the verb phrase. Well, within a noun phrase, there's a determiner and a noun. So that one's done. In um, the verb phrase, it like tries to figure out like where's the next noun phrase, basically. And then once it finishes, you've got the whole full structure. But these models also can back up. So as it's sort of looking at the sentence, if this were not a computer program and were a person, as it's looking at the sentence, it can hit a, um, a section that's like, wait, which one should I use? And so it'll try one, and if it doesn't work, it'll back up and try another one. So it has this kind of um, embedded loop system. So you'll see it's called recursive on purpose. So it'll kind of loop through all the possible options. Right? So it will backtrack if it's seen a new clause that doesn't make sense where, where it, it's seen the clause. So let's look at a recursive, dis recursive descent parser. So we'll load up articulate. And then the bad thing about most of these that aren't um, pre-trained systems is that you have to write the grammar. And the grammar is often written in um, kind of similar to regular expression style. And uh, they're, they're kind of clunky. So unless you move into a neural net kind of system, um, these to me are fairly, ooh, they're not hard to write actually at all unlike our NER taggers, um, but they can be a little clunky is the only word I can think of. Uh, yeah, so I can't think of another noun, uh, adjective there. Anyways, so what you do is you write in order, so we'll run through these in order, the rules. An easy rule is that a sentence breaks down into a noun phrase and a verb phrase. Okay, that's pretty much true true of most languages. Um, so then that verb phrase could be a verb and another noun phrase, or it could be a verb and a noun phrase and a preposition phrase. That preposition phrase could be a preposition and a noun phrase. Verbs, here are all the verbs that are possible. Noun phrases, it could be a single noun, and here are our single nouns. Or it could be a determinant and a noun, or it could be a determinant, a noun, and a preposition phrase. Here are our determinants, here are our nouns, and here are our prepositions. Now, the part that's mostly just um, syntactic rules is not, like once you get the hang of it, it's not that hard to write. But then to me where these become burdensome, is that you have to pre-process the text and tell it what all of these types of speech are. Um, which is fine, but that means as soon as the system sees a word it's never seen before, it will break. So you would have to constant you'd have to be adding before you ran um, any parser through it, you'd have to add the new words to it. All right. So what we would do is we would train our recursive descent parser, which essentially just means we tell it, here's the grammar, here are the rules. Okay. So we're just going to call this RD parser, and we've told it, here are our grammatical rules. Now you can also use systems that actually train, train, like more machine learning style, and we'll do that uh, next week. I'm going to take my sentence here, Mary saw a dog, and print out the tree. So we're going to parse dot parse here instead of dot tag um, or dot ant from last week. So parse here this sentence. Now if there's more than one possible tree based on your grammar, um, this system here for tree and parser will print them all out. 
if there's more than one and you just say parse, it'll like print out iterator object, which is not very useful to you, right? So instead, you just tell it to loop. Print me out all the possible trees. And with that, there are some graphing um, capabilities as well, but what that mostly does is it breaks it down uh, much like we'd expect, right? So sentence is the whole thing, noun phrase, verb phrase, verb, noun phrase, determinant, now. That's what it said over here. And that's how I broke it down using these <laughs> parentheses. Now there's some problems with this. Um, that particular grammar, minus the words themselves, but this particular like stru grammar structure actually will parse most sentences, okay, most English sentences. The problem is um, left cur uh, leftmost pieces. So uh, this is the left hand side of the grammar, meaning this is the, the end of the or the edge of the um, hey there, um, phrase structure part. And then there's the right side, how it breaks down. Okay, so let, this is a valid combination in English, that a noun phrase could break down into a noun phrase and a preposition phrase, but this can cause you problems because that is an indefinite loop. Because, well, then this noun phrase could be a noun phrase and a preposition phrase, and the next one could be yada, yada, yada. Okay, so this could cause it to get stuck, even though that is a valid form of syntax. Often these parsers are fairly slow because you have to first pre-process the text with all the <coughs> excuse me parts of speech, and then they're recursive, so they're iterating over each sentence maybe multiple times. While it's great that these backtrack, that backtracking system can actually discard the right answer and cause it to slow down even more until it kind of figures out or gets stuck in this loop. And um, in a sense, if you think about how people read, the fact that it views the whole sentence at once is a little odd. Like, practically, this makes sense. Okay, break, big sentence, break down, break down, break down, break down. But if I think about how humans work, we are reading chunks of a sentence at a time. We don't can't generally take in a whole sentence at once, um, unless it's very short. And then, um, so we're processing in such a way that we're getting like, well, here's the noun phrase and part of the verb phrase, where's the rest? Okay. So shouldn't we kind of think about sentences as if we are reading them? Okay. And that is what is called a shift-reduced parser. This is considered a bottom-up parser because it takes in the words kind of one at a time and um, sort of pops if a pattern is matched. So what it does is it reads in one word at a time, and if that word set combination matches one of your rules, it reduces those words into that rule. And it continues reducing until it's stuck or done. And so you just try to find the right side instead of the left side of that grammar and give it the left side label until you reach sentence or you break. And so the, it's called a shift because we're shifting one word into the window, sometimes called the stack. And then the reduce part is where it um, reduces that window. So if items in the stack currently match a right side rule, remember the right side rule. The right side rule, do, 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 here. This is the right side rule. So if there's a section that matches this, it reduces it down. A recursive descent parser looks for the left side and then reduces down to the right. So this work in different directions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here we go, here we go. And then this whole shift replace process works until it's done. So here's an example, the stack. So the first word happens, the. Well, in our grammar, the is labeled as a determinant. Cool, so when the next word happens, dog, that's a noun, neat. But after, um, so there are steps between these two, but after it sees these two together, it goes, oh, determinant noun, that's a noun phrase. So this becomes a noun phrase. Saw becomes a verb, and so on. 
<laughs> now that's logically very appealing, however, these also have their problems, which we'll get to in a second. And so in NLTK, it's the shift reduce parser to implement that. You train the parser by um, putting in the grammar that you built. And this has no backtracking because in theory, as words come in one at a time, I don't need to go back because I'm just reducing them as I see them. And so these are sometimes a little harder to write a good grammar for because you have to account for the fact that the first match it makes is the one it gives it. And so they often fail a little bit more than the other ones. And it only finds one tree, even if several are possible. So if there's any ambiguity, it just picks one of them and runs with it. Now this particular sentence, we got the same structure because this is a simple sentence that it really is not ambiguous. But if you play around with other sentences, it, you don't. So some problems. They can reach dead end. So even if the sentence is grammatical, if you have not written your grammar well enough, it will fail to find a tree, okay, which is not what you want. And that happens when the parse choice in the model is incorrect and it doesn't really, like you've reached the end of the sentence and you've got these leftover words and it's like, I don't know what to do with this word. I mean, like, this doesn't make any sense. Okay, so it's partially a, a problem with the way you've written the grammar and partially a problem with um, the fact that these can't back up. And what reduction should it use when there's more than one possible? So English, not English, language, everyone's language, not just English, is so creative that these can be hard to capture all the different permutations that are possible. And even then, even if you could, and we, we've seen them all, so to speak, um, there are several rules, usually at once, that you could use. And a shift reduce parser works best when there's one rule <laughs> instead of several. Alright. And so we could extend these. Okay, this is kind of where we're going. Um, and that's sometimes called a left corner parser. Okay, I don't have a good example of a left corner one because they take forever to run. But a left corner parser is meant to be a hybrid of a recursive descent parser and a shift reduce parser. So it is both a bottom-up and a top-down approach okay, two at the same time. And um, what it does is it says, well, here's the whole sentence. So I'm going to start breaking it down. But I'm also going to break it down and use kind of one word at a time so that I can um, not get stuck. Okay. So it's a top-down parser, mostly recursive descent, with some uh, shift-reducing rules that help filter what's coming next. And so the way it achieves that is it finds all the left corners. So remember that the left corner is things like a noun, a verb, an adjective, a preposition. Okay. And then from there, does little like mini recursive descent parsers on those specific chunks. Uh, all right, so. What, why, can't I remember? Okay, well, oh, okay. Let's say we are looking at this now. I was like, why is there just a picture here? Let's say we're looking at this sentence, <laughs> John saw Mary. A very simple sentence that's, you know, three levels deep and has a noun phrase and a verb phrase and a second noun phrase. So remember how we're defining grammar one. We have a noun phrase that is defined as either a determinant in a noun or a determinant in a noun in a preposition or John Mary Bob. And what a left corner parser does is it finds the left corners. So a left corner here could be um, the determinant or it could be John Mary Bob. And then the problem, uh, the problem becomes with a left corner parser, how do we know which left corner is the right left corner? Um, meaning, John and Mary are technically both left corners here. Okay. 
So which one should we start with? And they both end up being left corners, but they may not. All right. So let's see. Like I want to split this a little bit more evenly because I don't want us to have to do like 47 slides next time. But I also don't want to get too far into dependency parsing because it definitely um, goes better together. This would be before the code. Oh no, there's a bunch of code. Um, let's see. Let's see. Because this is where we get into the elephant pajama stuff. What's a head? What's head? What's constituents? Definitely don't want to do verb or special. All right. So let's do just a couple more slides so that next week it doesn't go like super long, but we'll still end a couple minutes early. Okay. okay, so break. That is all constituency parsing, sometimes called phrase structure parsing. The other main type of parsing is dependency grammars and dependency parsing. And generally, as you'll see next week, um, what happens is people often write translation rules. And this is how the parser we're going to use works, is it first does a constituency parser and then translates it into dependency grammar. So it helps if you know what constituency parsing is first. Okay, so what, in comparison, is dependency grammar? Um, so a phrase structure grammar, which focuses really on how to build these little mini cities from our sentences into noun phrases and verb phrases. Dependency grammar instead focuses on the relationship of the words in, co in context, focusing on semantics. So these words are related to each other because they depend on each other <coughs> versus they're just in the same city. And so we'll create what's called a head. The head of a dependency grammar is like the head of the sentence is usually the verb um, because the verb is usually the most constraining object in the sentence to determining what else is possible in the sentence. You can do them across adjectives or nouns, but here we're going to do verbs. It makes a lot of sense. And um, I pick ver verbs here because often every other word is sort of dependent on the verb or connected to the verb through this sort of weaving path of dependencies. So here's an example. And so this graph is often called a uh, projection graph. And the nodes here are each of the words. And the uh, arrows represent uh, the dependency. So in this particular case, what we see is the verb here. So shot, the subject of the shooting is the eye. The object of the shooting is the elephant. The determinant moderator on the elephant here. Um, now this preposition phrase is considered technically to be modifying elephant. So this is a, now, uh, a modifying noun phrase. Uh, here's the preposition modifier for pajamas and the determinant modifier for pajamas. And so essentially the, the sentence main structure is the subject and the object. Okay, so this is a head, the head of the sentence is the verb because this verb requires a direct object. So I shot the elephant. And then there's also a modifying phrase on elephant. See how this is very different than a constituency graph where these are broken down into noun phrases and verb phrases. This is like, what is the action that's happening? And forcing an interpretation on the semantics here. So the elephants and the pajamas. Uh, okay, that makes sense. A real world application of dependency parsing. Um, so a lot of text summarization uses a form of dependency parsing because it requires an understanding of the relationship between the objects. Now do remember that I, I think I've just said this that um, uh, brain fart 
most dependency parsing underneath the hood is a constituency graph that's been turned into a dependency graph. Uh, but if you have the dependency graph, you now can summarize this sentence and pull out all the um, extra stuff. And so you could say um, uh, just essentially what the sentence is about. This is better if you were using a whole big piece of text, right? But you could uh, summarize, use text summarization here. And at the end, towards the bottom, I wish I remember where it was exactly in here. Um, an example, maybe? Nope, that is not it. So later I'll show you an example of um, how this could be applied to text engine searches. Did I answer your question? That's a couple of examples. Perfect. Uh, okay, so if I wanted to do this with an LTK, which I wouldn't because it would be terrible and awful, um, we could write this in the same left-hand side, right-hand side structure where we're basically mapping these dependencies by hand. Okay. Uh. <laughs> Let's not. Um, we're going to write our own spacey trainer and show you how to write these things by hand. But instead, you would want to have a data set that has these mapped already that you run through until it's a train, okay. um, which is what spacey has kind of done. But we could use an LTK and want to shoot somebody, uh, maybe the elephant. But this is how it would be written, okay. these left-hand rules to these right-hand rules. And um, that would be terribly slow and awful. So next week we'll talk about something less terribly slow and awful. And just kind of a quick, um, to finish us up here, the graphs themselves, okay, so this is often an error that you'll see when you're writing your own, is that Spacey at the moment only supports what are called projective graphs. And so this is where all of the edges can be added without crossing each other up here they don't cross each other in the sense that um, uh, you know some of them go back but they don't cross so L, the back one here does not like cross over back to I so if I decided that the in my pajamas actually modified the I that would be crossing back and so all of the word and all of its descendants because um, we have to have new, they're not constituents anymore, they're descendants or dependents, if you want, are sort of a continuous sequence of words. So I can kind of leap forward and go back a little bit, but I can't go back a lot of it. And so here's an example. So this one here is projective because the arrows, while they kind of, they go over each other, they don't cross backwards. And in this particular case, um, if I did this car to is that would cross here because bought is modified by yesterday that's a time queue of when it's bought right and then car is the is red okay, so this that is red is an is a weird side clause that um, should be attached to car and yesterday is sort of in the way all right uh, let's do this slide. Two more slides. Okay. So I can write this in an LTK and then we'll forget that we saw this basically. Um, but just kind of to show you how people used to do this. Um, we took our Groucho Marx dependency grammar where we had to lay out all of our dependencies and we say, Hey, sentence, here you go. Um, and this one actually prints out two trees for us. Because based on the way that we wrote that left-hand side, right-hand side rule, there's actually two interpretations here. Where shot, um, and the way these print out is not very readable, shot modifies I and shot modifies elephant. Elephant modifies in my pajamas, right? Or I could say shot modifies in my pajamas. Okay. Because of the way this is written right here. So that in should really be tied to elephant, but um, it could also be the I, white, 
right? The shot, I'm doing the shooting in my pajamas. And so that actually allows us to capture the fact that this is an ambiguous sentence. All right, so here's the two different interpretations. Shot is I shot the elephant, the elephant's in the pajamas, versus I shot the elephant while in my pajamas. Okay, so in kind of goes back to I here. Um, so the nice thing is that that captured that ambiguity, whereas our constituency parser didn't really do a good job of that. 